joining the conference. This call may be recorded. Todd, this is Lauren. Yeah. Thank you, everyone who's starting to join us. We ask you to put your computer, your speaker on mute um, for sound quality. And may I check if Mark Johnson is on the call? I am here. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Welcome to the Learning Curve, a geriatrics professional development series. My name is Lauren Jones, and I'm the program manager of the Geriatric Scholars Program at the Greater Los Angeles Geriatric Research, Education, and Clinical Center. We are pleased to welcome you to the third year of this webinar series. This is the first webinar in a two-part series this year. The topic today is the effective use of technology in teaching, and our speakers will be Mr. Todd McKee and Dr. Ronnie Chernoff. This series is sponsored by the Employee Education System, EES, in collaboration with the Consortium of New York Geriatric Education Centers, the Arkansas Geriatric Education Center, and the VA Geriatric Scholars Program. This presentation will last approximately 45 minutes with a Q&A session of 15 minutes. Now I would like to introduce our speakers for today. Todd McKee is an instructional developer from Little Rock, Arkansas. He has worked for the Arkansas Geriatric Education Center and the Department of Geriatrics at the University of Arkansas for medical sciences for 12 years. He's worked with the Little Rock Grec during that time. He had a master's in educational technology, specializing in instructional design and multimedia. Ronnie Chernoff, PhD, RD, LD, CSG, and FADA, is Associate Director for Education and Evaluation for the Little Rock Grec and the Director of the Arkansas Geriatric Education Center. With that said, it is my pleasure to welcome Mr. McKee and Dr. Chernoff. Mr. McKee? Thank you. Uh, for those of you, uh, instructional developer, basically that means uh, I'm a computer guy. Um, I do a little bit of this, a little bit of that. Um, I'm on slide two for those who are following on slide share. Uh, I don't like to show my picture, but I thought, considering I'm trying to provide a level of context for everything, but you might want to see what I kind of look like. Um, I, I work for at the, the Arkansas Geriatric Education Center in the Little Rock Rec, and I basically do a little bit of everything um, related to computers. I do video editing, I do um, multimedia, I do audio visual, I do a little bit of this, a little bit of that. Um, on to slide three, for those, um, it is siesta time. Uh, for those who are accustomed to uh, watching presentations, I'm sure all of us as professionals, we've seen a lot of not so good uh, presentations, and I'm sure we've seen some really good presentations. What I'm hoping to provide today um, is not so much a, a full breadth of everything we can talk about, because there's a lot of stuff to talk about. But I just sort of want to give an outline, and we're on to slide four. Okay, um, really, the, the confines of this talk are related to giving presentations, specifically kind of giving professional talks, PowerPoint, keynote, uh, those kind of varieties, and potentially some teaching opportunities. And so what I really want to talk about a little bit is just sort of give us a broad definition of some of the types of media that we can deal with within giving a presentation. And I'm going to talk about some of the communication process and the message design. And then at the end, I sort of want to give some general guidelines on giving an effective presentation. And a lot of those are related to the design of your presentation. Because one of the things that I see all the time is I get presentations, and I have to sort of clean up the big presentations. And so I'm just going to give some of those guidelines with some of those. Um, on the slide five. So, well, what I'm talking about today, you can break these down into numerous ways, but I'm talking about different media types. And the types of media that I'm talking about today are specifically related to audio, visuals, which is a broad definition, video, animations, and actually real objects, uh, which you don't typically see people talk about within a giving a tech uh, presentation, but that's actually the best can provide it. One of the things we need to think about when we deal with media is that, as a general rule, if we use more than one media, it usually helps us with retention. But one of the things we have to be very careful of is if we use 
too many, we can overwhelm the stimulus of the people that we're talking to. So we really need to evaluate the things based on the strengths and weaknesses of the different media types and also what we're trying to portray. Okay? So first one I just want to lightly talk about is tech. Um, we, as we give these, we're talking about words, symbols, equations, almost anything. And the professionals that we're giving talks to, this is actually the fastest way to provide information. It's probably the most reliable way to provide information. But what we probably run into is it can't adequately represent everything. If I were going to ask you to give me a description of what an elephant looks like, it would take you a long period of time. And so you have to use other means to do that. And so one of the things, I kind of consider this as our foundation. The test is going to be the foundation of almost any presentation we give. Then we want to delve beyond that. The next one I want to talk about lastly is audio. And this can be what you're hearing now, the human voice. Now the fact, different specific sounds, if I were to play um, music from a movie, it would invoke some emotion. It really helps taking attitude and uh, channeling in with the most of the last. And it, it's really more effective when the topic is fairly simplistic. If you try to do a long speech, it will soon out before they get all the way through. So you really, it's more effective if you combine it with other things. If you combine it with some video, if you combine it with some animation, or if you just combine it with text. It really helps. One of the problems that you run into, though, with audio is if you're going to do audio over the top of the text, if you're doing the same, you tend to have a lot of problems because one of the problems that we run into is we all read at different speeds. And we get frustrated. We either tune out because it's going too slow or it's going so fast it overwhelms us. And so it becomes a real problem. So you sort of have to weigh that out. almost 
like TV, and people will tune it out and they won't pay that much attention to it. So you, it becomes like anything else. You have to weigh the pros and cons of every video. And one of the things that a lot of people use is they like to use it for introductions or as a break up something and to uh, use bring back some attention. Okay. It also have, does have a potential to overwhelm because if you have a lot of stimulus and listening, you're trying to read potentially, you're watching something going on, it can overwhelm the, the receiver of this information. And so you really have to weigh it back and forth. Well, the last one is just animations. And animations really are cool because it gives you some of the benefits of video, but you can use it in even more abstract items. You can show, in this case, this video, if I were to show this animation, this is about how a lap band works from a procedure, how it works. Well, if I were to try to show you in that in a video, it would be almost impossible for me to show all the detail that you can show with an animation. It simplifies it down, and it really helps explain difficult concepts and to, to explain simulations where items are almost impossible for us to actually see but we can see the relationships of them. And then the last one I want to talk about is real objects. And this is great, especially um, uh, when you have them available. We've recently had some talks where we were talking about falls. And one of the speakers had all of these alarms, these bed alarms, these chair alarms, all these different things. And it, be, and it helped give a sense that uh, or even a video wouldn't show you. She actually had them when you the size, you can see how they worked, all of the pieces that were close and available. This doesn't work for everything, and but it does, if it is available, it is the most powerful way for you to move somebody along with this communication. Okay. And one of the things I really try to think about is when I'm building a presentation, really the text, the, that's the core of what I'm going to deliver with because it's the easiest for me to deliver. If you're in a teaching situation where you can have a longer periods of control, you may move away from more text and provide that in other me mechanisms. You may have to read outside and then come into a, a situation where it's more interactive. But for a typical presentation, for a professional presentation, you're going to, most of what you're going to be delivering is text. If you can provide more than one media, it is, it's going to be better in the long run. The retention rate goes up, which I'll show in just a minute. And but one of the questions we always have to ask is, are we enhancing or are we distracting? Because like, I can put a visual on the screen, and in one case it may be a distraction, and in another case it may be an enhancement. Don't put it up there just to have a clip art on a, on a page. It's not going to provide an extra layer or explain something or give a context, and it's not worth it. And really, we need to understand that really, the media is going to take one portion of the communication. It's just this one portion of how you carry your message. And I kind of want to give an example. Um, last week, and I live in we live in Arkansas, and my family, I was in Las Vegas of the Midwest, I guess. I don't know how to describe it. We were up there, and recently they had a tornado. Now, I was aware that they had had a tornado because I had seen some text. That provided me some level of context, but it really didn't tell me what had happened. Now, if I had been watching the news, maybe I could see some images of how that divides later that I didn't have before of the destruction that was there. <laughs> Everyone, please mute your phone. And Todd, if you could give the slide share address again over yes. the phone, that would be great. Yeah, that'd be okay. Uh, it is at www.slideshare.net slash pod ODD. And slide share is just exactly And I'm on slide 13 if you're looking on that. I'm sorry, I forgot to mention which slide I'm on. Um, let's get example. Okay, so if I were to want to understand what had happened in Branson even more, I could have gone out and I could have looked at the animations. I could have seen, in this case, the radar images, or somebody else posted an animation 
where they showed the storm path on Google Earth. All of those provide extra layers of complexity to the item. And I can also go out and I can see a video. And that video would show me even more of what had happened, of the sheer destruction. Now, which one of those is the best one? Well, it depends on your situation. Maybe I just want to relay the, the sheer damage of what, what had happened. I can relay that in, with just simple text and maybe a simple image just to sort of say, hey, there was a lot of damage, X number of dollars. There was no lives lost, things along those lines. But if I really want to relay the emotions of it, showing the sheer destruction through a video relays it even more so. And so, or it, there's actually some audio of when the storm sirens were going off. People had recorded audio, and you could hear the tornado in the background of some of these storm spotters. And so, if I wanted to relay the terror that some of the people may have had at that moment, the audio may be the best route for me to relay that on. So, it depends. You vary depending on what you're wanting your message to be. All right. So... The next portion I really want to talk about is sort of the, the communication process. Because we need to sort of evaluate everything, the media, what we're wanting to do. And so there are numerous different mechanisms or pieces that they talk about for this process. This is just one of them that I had grabbed. And I apologize, I, didn't, I forgot to put the reference on here. Um, but I can give you the reference if you want more information. But really, it starts with me as a speaker or you as the speaker. You're the source of this information. You're the one relaying the information. And then you relay a message. And if that message starts to leave you, you have to encode in your mind, you have to encode this and wrap it in some sort of mechanism so that the person on the other end can receive that message. And so one of the potential problems, if I encode this in an awkward manner, the person on the other end may not be able to receive it. Then we go through and it could some sort of channel. So it can be any number of things. It can be our language, it can be our the, the text, it can be the media, it can be uh, any number of it. And so um, the, the channel is this media definition for us. This is the mechanism by which we pass this information. And so we then, the, the person the other end then has to decode that message. They take what we have said, what we could, and then they, they have to decode it and wrap it around and then receive that information. So now I've got part of a chain here. Now, typically, now this is a little more awkward today because I'm this is a little more like how they to get see all of the, the uh, non-language cues that we might typically see in a, giving a presentation, but. We also receive, receive feedback. As you ask me questions, the, then I get feedback from you. And so that feedback then creates a loop so that I can then see what you, hopefully I've passed my message, you have received my message, and then I can so that I can continue on and move forward. Now, one of the things we need to be aware of is anytime we check uh, the message, there is a context to it. If I'm in a grocery store, context is probably a little more laid back. It's everything around that. It, it, that waste, context is a little heavier in that it's supposed to be a If you're standing up on a stage, it's a completely different context in the way that I portray the message. So everything happens within these. And the other last piece that we need to be aware of is that every time we portray a message, one of the things that happens is we bring our own experience and that portrays how we're going to encode it and what our assumptions are and how that message is going to be received. But on the flip side of that, our receiver has some semblance of experience, some uh, items that they bring to the table. And so then those two experiences, this whole thing becomes this large loop that we've got to, we've got to send down the pipe. And this happens many times in, a, in a, a minute in that we're sending out words, we're hoping that receiving them, all of these pieces come into play. And one of the pieces that tends to happen on this is we tend to get noise. Now, in this case, uh, there is a lot of noise. 
and the noise on the line, we're having to deal with all of those, but we're also having to deal with the distractions that are around us. Dealing with the, the multimedia in this case, is live meeting or slide share, are they working? Are they not doing what I, what I, what I needed to do? So every one of those is a noise path, and every one of those can break up the potential of this uh, loop. And so we need to be aware of all of these things that happen when we're giving a presentation so that we can portray that and then hopefully the feedback will provide some level that we're able to then adjust our message, repeat it, use a different pathway. We might, if we come back to this presentation, maybe I provide more audio examples so that I can try to manipulate this message process to be as good as I can possibly make it given all of these uh, pieces. So. This just really provides us with the potential for experience. Now, this has uh, been around since the 50s, this Dale's Cone of Experience. And really, this talks about um, how we might be able to relate to information. And so these upper levels of this provide volume of information. They provide more information at a faster rate and with the potential need of more Support. If I'm reading text and pictures, I've got to get some sort of context for them. As I move down from those, they involve more participation. It's more active. As I look down this, as I move down this, will we have live demonstrations, role play, and potentially direct experience. Another way to look at this is on this next. Look at this. We have read. Here, if I'm reading something, if I'm hearing something, if I view images, watch video, all the way down to actually doing something, like doing a demonstration. The thing that I really like to look at is on this left side, it says 10% of what they read, they remember. 20% of what they hear, 30% of what they see, and 50% of what they hear and see. So as we add the extra layers of media, it provides potential to read and have a better picking point for the our, for our receivers. That's really what we want. We're hoping that they will remember something that we've said. So as we continue, continue to go down this, some of these are beyond the realm of a, of a typical presentation. I'm not going to be able to simulate a real life experience in this situation. So best I can hope for it is maybe you can remember 50%, maybe 30%. So uh, these things are in there so you provide some of these pieces for this. Okay? Now, the, net, the last culture I really want to talk about, these are sort of designing for presentation. This is sort of the next whole of what, what happened. And these guidelines are sort of a little bit from experience because I've dealt with this. One of the things that we deal with on a regular basis is we get a video conference or we give conferences and we get complaints for about Lies, and we get about all these, all these things. And I've seen a recent uh, survey on the things annoyances from PowerPoint. And one of the things is reading your slides. This text was too small. They couldn't read everything. They used full sentences. And they was too complex. These guidelines are here to try to help alleviate some of this. So, one of the things is uh, really these are simple, big, simple clear, progressive, and consistent. And I'll break these down for what I mean by these. Okay, big, this one should be obvious. Make it big. Use large fonts. The typical fonts you see in PowerPoint templates are nowhere near large enough. I usually go in and immediately start bumping them up. I don't want to get too technical about it, but you can go into something called the master slide and you can adjust those and you can make it where if I bump it here, it's going to bump it across all of the slides that those. So I go in and adjust those. I make those much larger. I usually go up at least two two bumps above what I have here. So what do I mean by that? These are some typical font sizes you might see. Well, Arial 12 point is what you see on a Word document. That's not going to work very well in this case. Okay, those are just small. Typically, 30 is my kind of bare minimum. 
unless I'm doing a reference or something else. I want to stick above 30 because you're not going to be able to read it. The general rule of thumb, if you want to see what I'm talking about, you need to look at your computer monitor, go back about six to eight feet, and whatever you can read at that is what you should expect that your, your listeners might be able to see. So it provides some level of content for that so that you know, hey, I need to try to make everything bigger. It just helps. In this case, it's a little bit of less is more on a slide. Next portion is really keep it simple. Don't need to go crazy. I know there's a thousand fonts, there's a thousand different colors. There's all kinds of boxes in here, but we don't always need to use those. Okay? I usually, some people use the six by six or the six by seven rule. I try to go even more where I want less than that. Five by six, five lines, six more per, uh, per line. That's sort of a guideline. It's not hard and fast got something that you need more than that and it doesn't, it's not the next break, then I, I might break that rule. But one of the things, don't be afraid to have more than than 20 or 30 slides. Having additional slides, you're not going to spend as much time per slide. You can expand those out. You can still continue to expand what you want. You can have more slides. It's not going to hurt. And it, it usually works out better in that you can, it helps the receivers be able to take in the amount of information. If you go too much per slide, I see this all the time. I'm sorry, physicians, but this is really bad. It's a lot of my physician slides. That's because it's one of the legacy items. We want to fill it up as much as we can. It becomes too much. Um, I usually end up, when I'm dealing with uh, presentations, I usually end up having a breakup slide, split up two, and it usually works out pretty well. Now, as far as the, the rest of it, this is kind of what I typically see from some of my people. They want to throw the whole the whole definition there. And that that's okay. It's very specific if you want to lock in on a full thing. The problem on this case is just too detailed. You just can't keep up with that much information. You're going to you're going to scan it and read it, and you're going to be a little bit confused on what what important portions of this. I, as the person, the source of this information, I need to control that. I'm really wanting you to lock in on these. I want you to know that it's a process that it was involves some procedures and tools. So that I can go through, if I pair that down to this, this is a nice size of you might be able to remember. It tells that these are the important portions of this. This is easier, okay? One of the things that we see all the time is people like to use clip art, and I get these, and people use clip art, they either use a lot of clip art or they don't use any clip art. Um, just because you have the access to clip art doesn't mean you should use it. Please avoid, I don't like clip art in general, but... Uh, I, I like images, I like photos, I'm fine with line drawing, but I'm not real big on this clip art stuff just to put it on there. I, I, I sort of battle this, people know that, oh, well, if I put text with an image, it's supposed to give better, uh, help people remember. The, these images aren't going to help you remember anything other than I had to react to color art in there. Thank you. The next thing, sound, and I don't know that this will play, but I'm on slide 27 for people. Yeah, I'm thankful that I'm hoping this book does not play. This is one of the, everybody occasionally, they get in and they, they take a, a PowerPoint class and they get in and they start lumping all these things and, ooh, look at these cool effects and they use the typewriter effects and they add all these things and they add these sound effects, whooshes and flaps and uh, rip shot sounds and everything, and it becomes overwhelming. And people in the audience basically sit out and they're waiting to hear what's the next crazy sound effect. They don't even remember anything about your presentation other than the crazy sound effect. So avoid those if possible. Um, transitions, uh, transitions and animation kind of go hand in hand. A transition technically is the uh, what it, uh, PowerPoint means is the transition is between slides and on the slide. Okay? The really wow effects are really fun and they're graded to do in a PowerPoint.
point class, but leave them in the class unless you have a very specific purpose for it and use them maybe one per presentation. And it's only if you put them on and stick with something. You can use a peer and disappear. The other one is fade. I need it dissolved with the other ones that I, I typically stick with. I will occasionally get really wild and go with the fly-in, but it's very subtle fly-in. I don't usually go for any of the wild big ones unless I'm dealing with small children, and then I throw as many of these as I possibly can because it will entertain them for hours. Okay? The next piece is make it clear. Avoid all caps. Um, it's just too difficult to read. We're not accustomed to reading that. It's only it's fine for a simple word if you really want to say this is important. Uh, use upper and lower case. Use the typical items that you would expect to see. Okay. But generally, uh, when you're doing like a, a Word document, a, a serif font is usually the preferred method. On a presentation, stick with the sans serif. And the way I usually remember this is the, the sans serif means no feet. That's, that's how I usually remember. If you see that have the little, the little embellishments on the end, I call those feet. The ones that they don't have feet, serif, and then you have serif fonts. Stick with the uh, sans serif font. Typically they're talking to Homa, which I'm kind of tired of seeing, Arial, which I'm tired of seeing. There's numerous other new fonts. Uh, that you can look at to help those. And so stick with those within a presentation. Uh, you can use the other ones. I use occasionally, I will use a serif font for a quote, and it's only for that specific purpose, and that's the only time I use it because I want it to feel like it's coming out of a book. And that's the only time I really break that, that kind of rule. Um, uh, avoid underlines if you can, because PowerPoint by default makes web links for those, and so that becomes a real problem. People think, is it a link? Is that not a link? What is it? Uh, use colors instead, and I'm going to get into a little bit more color action in just a moment. Um, if you're doing something in order, go ahead and use the numbering. It's there. It'll make things where people understand that these are a process. It's not a one time or that these are not intermingling uh, with each other. Just use the the uh, list, use bullet. People are good. Um, it really does help with retention because you really pare it down. Use four bullet points if you can do it. All right, now we're going to get into the colors. Oh, I apologize. I, my spell check uh, inadvertently went a little British on me. Uh, the use uh, contrasting colors. Light on dark or dark on light. In this case, for this presentation, I want to put the light. I've done a lot of dark presentations where it's a dark background, which is typically what I use. But in this case, I wanted to use something a little different. So I use a lighter background, and all of my stuff is dark, except for this one little section here. It really does help. The, the most contrast is actually a bright yellow on a black. That is the most contrast you can possibly get. Um, it does help in that it helps getting visibility. It provides a stark contrast. My impression of that is I don't want to use it all the time because it really is kind of patchy because it's such a stark contrast between them. I usually try to go a little more subtle, but you can see that it's too difficult to use the yellows on the lighter colors. If you're going to go, you don't want to use complementary. You put your uh, primary colors and use the opposite if you're going to use something basically you want to use opposite because it may stand out. It makes it a little easier to manage. Okay. When you're talking about size, size does really relay importance. What is the most important thing on this slide? It's still to the text. The, the, uh, the image in this case has no relevance to this. But on the other one, it really relayed. My eye immediately goes to that. You need to be aware of those. If you really want to make a stark contrast, if you really want to say this is a big deal, you need to Okay? Be progressive. Now, if I were to throw this slide up to you, you, you would want, I, your siesta would begin now. I would expect that your siesta would begin now. You're going to fall asleep. 
you're not going to understand anything that's going on on this. It's just entirely too busy. Now, I can relay the same information by bumping it one piece at a time. And it, I've got it these set where they all come in one right after the other. But if I really wanted to bump it one piece at a time so that I can explain those pieces, in the end, I may have a little bit of a busy slide, but people are going to be able to take that keeping it in small bite by ton. But throw it all out of it, it's just overwhelming. It's drinking out of a water hose, I mean, out of a fire hose. Okay? The other thing is, you really need to be consistent. And this is where I struggle on people when they create their own presentations. They, I get some things that are all over the map. I get, well, they've used different presentations, they've had different backgrounds, they've had different people. Okay? If you're going to use something to be different, it does draw attention. All of a sudden, you notice, hey, there's a tick mark, something different here. This is important. Either it's, I can use the, uh, the pieces of the or I can use colors, okay? If colors imply something there, okay? Don't go crazy. If I throw too many cups, fix the water. Nobody knows what's going on. I don't know what I have any, any idea what's going on. It's, I'm completely distracted. Find to figure out what the message is that you're trying to deliver to me. I have no idea what you mean by any of this, okay? Stick with a couple of colors. I'm usually stick with a palette of two, maybe three. I usually have a primary one, which is my bullet, uh, and that's usually either a, a dark color or a, or a white, and then I have, have one for the heading, and then I have another secondary color that I use to bring to point out that I want, hey, this is important, okay? If you're going to bring in items, you can, I don't know that I would use this one, but it does bring up a point where, oh, hey, there's something important here. This is important. Now, this does not bring importance to me because all of a sudden it's chaos. But just be consistent about what you want to do. Be consistent with your font. Be consistent with your cover. Be consistent with your face on how you bring things in. Okay? So, big things. Be big. Bigger is always better. Generally. Be simple. It's okay. Keep it simple. Be clear. Be consistent. And be, be progressive. It's okay to bring those bills in. You just don't want to go crazy with them. Okay? The last thing I want to mention is, really, we're talking about communications here. Anytime you're giving a presentation, it is communication. I am communicating with my audience. Now, it may be one-on-one, -on -one, or it may be one to a thousand but it's still communication. I've got to understand it in those contexts. Text will be your your groundworks. It'll be your building blocks. Everything else is on top of that. Use visuals, but use them judiciously. Animations or video are great, but it's really for very uh, specific purposes. Show complex relationships with those. That is the best use. And then sound, use it only when absolutely necessary, when it is the truly the only way for you to relay something about that, that fear of that tornado of somebody's voice on the telephone, that there's no way for me to relay that any other way, but it works perfect for that, okay? Now, if you have any questions, I'm done. I'm trying to end. I was trying to be really good on my time today. Uh, if you have any questions after the fact, you want to ask me something, my email address is Todd, T O V D, at uams.edu. And I've given the slide share portion. This is available there if you want to get to it. And it is slideshare.net slash Todd. I'm open for questions now. Thank you, thank you Todd. I'd like to open it up to questions for the group. You can also type your questions in live meeting. I don't know, Todd, if you're, if you're assuming you're at this time. Yeah, I'm trying to get down. Uh, let's see. Echoing. Slide share. Sorry, I'm trying to get to your questions. Um, if you go for the, if somebody who asked, if you go to the slide share, I had allowed you to be able to download those slides. Um, 
if you want PowerPoint, you are more than welcome to use them. Um, if you need some specific questions about something else in there, you're, please feel free to email me. I'll, I'll relay on if you want some of the references that I use. Um, I forgot to put them in the back end of the presentation. Um, I'll be happy to provide those. Todd, and can you verbally give your email address for those that aren't? Yes. The, the simplest one is Todd, T-O-D-D, -D, at U-A. MS.edu. And uh, slide share, I may be on, listed on there. Uh, if you go to the slide share, you might be able to send me a message from there. I, I will get those just about any way and answer about any questions uh, through any mechanism if you have some specific questions you want to ask me about. Uh, I'd be happy to get more technical if I needed to, but I assume I don't want to go too crazy. Hi, Todd. This is Dean. I had a quick question. Uh, sure. You covered, a, you covered a lot of the, the visual uh, whatnot here, and I think that was your main focus. Do you have any particular suggestions for uh, visual or other ways to keep an audience engaged while you're going through presentations like this? Um, are you talking about specifically on visuals, or are you talking about... Um, well, whatever would go along with this presentation, I guess. Um, if there are specific... Yeah, I mean, you say not to use distracting things, but can, would you recommend using anything uh, like the transition to, to, to keep it or get back attention? Um, I, yeah, I do that from time to time on uh, some of my talks. A lot of times, um, in, in this talk I didn't use it, but sometimes what I would use is um, I use a different transition, a, a little bit fancier, a little more wild transition. When I'm getting to a large bullet, or large bullet um, in the case of, like in this case, my outline, my three main points, I may actually do a transition that would really bring you back and bring the focus back to say, whoop, something just changed. Um, it's similar to using the concept of having maybe color coding where you have um, red, green, and blue for your colors of your key sections and you use those so that they give context. It just helps provide that. Um, really, a lot of the interactivity pieces are in how it, it depends on the situation. If I'm giving a professional talk, it's a little different than if I'm teaching. Does that make sense? I'm not trying to get out of that question, but it varies. If I'm teaching, there's by asking questions, having some planted questions throughout. If you're talking about within the confines of a larger presentation, I would typically use some building blocks to bring those in and help tie in potentially through what I would deem as storytelling. If you think back to the story of me telling you going to Branson, storytelling is a great way to bring in, and for the medical profession, really you're talking about providing a case. If you wrap your, your presentation around cases, it really helps draw them in because then they're starting to think they're engaging in that. Does that make sense? It, it, yeah, just very depending on exactly what you're wanting to do. I, I, I really encourage, um, there's several books out there kind of on using storytelling. And um, in the case, I always think of storytelling in the medical profession as providing a case. Anytime I hear about storytelling, you're talking about a case. Let me tell you about in the case of geriatrics, let me tell you about this 76-year-old woman. If you've got a picture, it can be a clip art picture or something like that of an older woman. Let me tell you about, this is, this is Jane Doe. She came into the clinic and X, Y, Z. So those kind of things help draw us in because we're storytelling people. We tend to re really jump on those and follow in on that. You almost can't help but want to become a little bit more engaged by that. Todd, this is Dr. Chernoff. Yes. And I wanted to add something in terms of, um, I'm going to have to mute something here. I'll just hold on a second. If you turn down your phone. Yeah. Uh, okay. Um, I, just, I just attended a meeting. It was about, there were about 70 people in the room, and one of the ways that the speaker had of engaging the audience was to use a system with clickers. And a slide would come up and ask the audience, um, for their opinion on something that the presenter was about to present. 
And it's a very simple technology, and everybody just gets a little, uh, it's about the size of your, of your um, smartphone, and it gives you the option of pressing A, B, C to respond to the question of the presenter, and then the response is all display on the screen, and then the instructor or the lecturer was able to um, then address what the point that she was going to make. And it was very effective because everybody was very engaged by it. So there are new technologies that are coming out that allow that in a live classroom or a live meeting situation um, that will keep the, the uh, participants, the attendees, engaged in what it is that's going on. Um, I think that we all know that sitting and listening for about an hour um, as somebody who is given more than my fair share of all of these presentations, um, that you you can stand there and lecture um, and you see the pockets of people around the room who are dozing off while you're talking. And so you have to learn to take, not take it um, personally. But um, there are a lot of those new kinds of technologies that are now becoming available at fairly reasonable, as actually very reasonable prices. Um, the one I saw was on teaching physics, and it really, really helped to simplify the concept to be able to engage the audience and, and ask them what they thought the answer to the question ought to be. So there's, there are other technologies that are now available that, um, that are very successful in engaging people. I will dovetail a little bit on that. There are some uh, of the brands, and I've, I'm drawing a uh, blank on a specific brand. There are some that allow to do similar to clicker technology, but you can do it where it's through a text message and on top of um, the individual clickers. The clickers, um, there's numerous brands of those out there, and the software tends to be fairly specific to those, and I've seen them done really, really well. If you really want to start to engage, that's a great way to do it, and if you're in a teaching aspect, that is a fabulous way to do it. If you're in a typical presentation where it's a one-time only or once or twice, a little more difficult to get all of those things uh, to bring the clickers, but the one that does the cell phones is actually very cool. Um, I got to do that one. I've done that one at a conference where they had um, uh, they were doing polls and such through those, and it was very nice because you just it's very much like American Idol in that you you send a text message to this number and it does a poll, and that's what it does. You send a, or a letter. You know, A, B, C, or D into this poll, and it basically can do that. Okay, we have five more minutes. We have time for maybe one more question. If you just want to unmute your phone and ask. Well, I was just going to, to add one of the things that Todd and I see um, enormous amount of, and I know that you will all react to this, are all of the people who get up there and show a 12 by 12 screen full of, of numbers some kind of a table. Um, and everybody's seen them and everybody hates them because you can't read them. But our suggestion to our speakers is if you could just print that out and we could make it part of the handout, the, the people who are trying to actually really follow what you're talking about will have a, a much more legible version of that. And I just wanted to, to add that into the slide-making part of this. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Chernoff. Um, um, I, have one more, I have one more little thing in re reference to the uh, using a text message. Um, I've seen a creative use of um, Google Voice. Google Voice allows you to send and receive text messages um, from basically similar to like an email, like a Gmail account, and it's completely free. And I've seen people use that to receive questionnaires. So they pose a question, they let people reply to that, they give out that, that text number, which in the case is just a, it's just a phone number. They reply back to that with their cell phones for answers, and they do a, it's a quick tally. They can look at their screen, and basically they see how many text messages they got, and they can kind of see a quick count. Oh, I got 14 people who said A, 3 who said B, and 7 who said C. That way you can do, almost do a very quick tally there on some of those. And they also had, they used it to, uh, in the case of uh, give prizes and do some other things away. So they were able to use 
Google Voice in a little bit creative way and be able to pr provide a number that people, because I know most of the people as we go in, most of us have our cell phones with us. If you're going into a classroom of students, they all have their cell phones. They're probably texting while you're talking. As much as we don't want to talk about it, they are doing it. And it's nothing against you. They can multitask. People are able to multitask, text, pay attention. My wife thinks I can't do it. I prove her wrong almost every single time. There, there's a couple instances where I'm not paying as close attention as I need to, but they're able to do that. So this provides a little mechanism to be able to provide some feedback to you on the cheek because invariably while we, we always make the key. So I just wanted to mention that as a potential creative way to, to get around that. All right. Well, thank you guys so much for participating in this wonderful webinar on the effective use of technology. On behalf of the Geriatric Scholars Program, we would like to thank Mr. McKee and Dr. Chernoff. If you need slides or registration help, you can email Lauren Jones at lauren.jones, J-O-N-E-S, as in snake, at va.gov. We look forward to you joining us for our April 26th webinar on improving clinical care through quality improvement. You can email Lauren Jones for more information on this April webinar. And once again, if you're joining us through the phone and you don't have access to live meeting, you can get Todd's slides at slide share, one word, S-L-I-D-E, share, dot net, N-E-T, slash, Todd, T-O-D-C. Thank you so much, and goodbye. Thank you. Thank you.